Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. On this channel, we don't really do a lot of theory videos, and that's because they're hard to come up with, and I have to really believe in something if I want to make a video about it. But I recently connected a few dots, and I'm starting to think I'm onto something kind of crazy. In this world of Peredia, there's something wrong with it. I think we can all sense it, and I'm starting to believe that it's all connected to Ahsoka Tano. Peridia is a place where the Force is quite powerful, and it's connected seemingly to a dark side presence. If the giant ring of purple bones surrounding the planet didn't give you that impression, then the bleak and stark landscape punctuated by tall and gaunt towers crowned by tortured Nightsister faces surely will. Look at how these towers are arranged in a ring around a central keep, geometrically spaced apart with the Night Sisters standing on a podium directly in the middle, overlooking the plains. This is the high ground. I'm sure Obi-Wan Kenobi would approve, but why do they need this high ground? Is this a fortress, a watchtower? Is this a place where they can set a beacon, sending out signals for someone to come along and rescue them? Looking at how these Night Sisters connect their threads using these focusing orbs, I can't help but see these giant towering statues being large fence posts connected together by some kind of energy wall to protect them from whatever monstrosities lie waiting for them in the wasteland or perhaps is it designed to keep someone from escaping maybe this isn't a fort at all but a prison instead do you guys notice the lack of sound on this planet there's no noise of birds or other creatures all you can really hear is the immenseness of the surroundings and this is a place where belief in higher power and gods is as natural as the sense of fear and vulnerability you get from the lack of hiding places to duck under i get that same feeling when i'm driving through the plains of montana and i see a thunderstorm off in the distance now maybe it's the Night Sisters that everyone fears. I mean, they are bold enough to wear red. They're bold enough to stand on top of this tower, exposed from all directions. Yet these great mothers, they seem eager to leave this planet as much as Thrawn does. The way they grovel at him reminds me of, you know, that girl at the party who didn't want to talk to you at all until she realized that you're the only person sober enough to drive her home. I mean, what happened here? All we know is that this was once a great Dothmuri kingdom. But then everything stops, the civilization just disappears. What hellish portal do these Night Sisters open? I see what once was the great witch kingdom of the Dathmiri. The existence of the Great Mothers confirms this. This is the classic tale of a civilization that's reached its zenith and drunk with power, arrogantly orchestrate their own downfall through the pursuit of more power and unleash some kind of evil monster onto their lands? If it's a Dothmiri civilization we speak of, then clearly this downfall has something to do with their dark magic and dark powers. I mean, look at everything on this planet. It's so hostile. Why are the bandits so well armored? Why are these little crab people built with such thick protection and camouflage? Why are there no permanent settlements? Why is everyone a nomad constantly moving around? Come on, you never stay in one place for very long. Let's help them pack up. What if the red rib and the gold plating on the night troopers are not magic designed to hold spirits inside of the troopers? What if these aren't even undead troopers? What if that theory is wrong? What if these are just charms to protect them from some greater evil lurking off in the distance in the wastelands? While everyone seems desperate to leave, only one individual does not, and that's Balin Skull, the ex-Jedi who remembers tales as a youngling about this planet. Perhaps this is what drew him here in the first place. This is a land of dreams and madness. Children's stories come to life. Stories of this galaxy are considered folk tales. Some ancient past, long forgotten. I wonder what this tale actually said. If I were to guess, I would say that the Jedi were big on preventative measures, and so this is probably a frightful tale, meant to scare younglings into obedience and compliance, so that they don't fall behind in their lectures or get lazy with their lightsaber sparring practice. But I feel like this story has some truth to it. After all, they are here now, in this place. Judging by its remote location, by its fragile connection to the world of Cetos, my first impression is the Dothamiri civilization spawned out of Peridia and traveled first to Cetos, perhaps by following the migration patterns of the Purgles, but in reverse. If creatures started just appearing on my planet to die, I would want to know where the hell they're coming from. 
It was actually the Purgle that first inspired early ship designers in Star Wars to figure out their own way to enter the hyperspace dimension and invent the hyperdrive. And Morgan Elsbeth claims that the Dothmuri were the first to tame these Purgle and ride them from one planet to another. Crossing the stars, I'm guessing, from Peridia to Dothomir, unless it's the other way around. And the pathway of Peridia is a one-way journey. Unless you have this crazy hyperdrive-enabled ship like the Eye of Scion. And so this path to Peridia might not be a two-way road, it might just be a one-way road to a dead end, a perfect place to discard someone who's dangerous and no, I'm not just talking about these Night Sisters, the Great Mothers, I'm not just talking about Thrawn, maybe there are some older prisoners on this planet. Something with immense power that might be too hard to destroy. Something that is feared by the Jedi so much that they bother making fairy tales and ghost stories about it. And when Balin's skull is on this planet, it is clear that he senses something reaching out to him through the Force. Perhaps he's driven by his imagination, which is fed by those tales he learned long ago. But Balin's skull is a serious individual. He's a wise individual. He's seen a lot. And I'm starting to feel like uh, he's onto something. Something calls to me. Can't you hear it? Something stirs here. Can't you see it? Whatever it is, it's immensely powerful in the Force. And it's here we begin to understand the motivations of Balin's skull. You see, he is after power like many other beings in the galaxy. But it's not the type of power that the Sith would traditionally pursue. Won't our alliance with Thrawn finally bring us into power? That sort of power is fleeting. Do you hear that growling? It's not just the wind, it comes and goes throughout the episode. It's something unnatural. Balin's skull does not want the power of the Sith. He knows about the power that mere mortals always try to wield and fight over. He's tired of it all. He says as much. He's seen the power of the Jedi get wiped out in one swift blow thanks to the creative genius of Darth Sidious and his clones. He's probably heard of how Darth Sidious' own end came after his apprentice picked him up and threw him down a reactor shaft like a piece of trash. Balin's skull is not a fool. He doesn't want power for power's sake. He doesn't want that type of power, which is fleeting. He wants an ultimate type of power, one that is probably out of reach of mere mortals like him, usually. What I seek is the beginning, so I may finally bring this cycle to an end. And that beginning is here. If the old stories are true. I really hope that the next episode starts with the story of the Pathway of Peridia, maybe told by one of the older members of the Jedi Order back in the day. And it's a story about a servant to the gods. These gods were known as the Celestials, the father, the son, and the daughter, powerful beings who represented balance, the dark side, and the light. This servant was immortal, and she loved her gods. But as she grew older, her sight grew dimmer, her legs grew weaker, and she saw her own end at the horizon. And this made her very fearful and sad and lonely. She didn't want to die. She didn't want to leave her gods behind. And so she goes to a forbidden area where great powers are held. In this place, there was the Fanta Power, which was a nexus of dark side energy. It offered individuals unlimited power. She would drink from it. Then there was the pool of knowledge that separated one's mind from one's body and allowed them to see both the past and the future. She would bathe in it. You see, these centers of power were never meant for mortals. They were never supposed to see it, touch it, consume it, you know, dip yourself into it. And this is what would drive the serpent mad. And she would become known as the mother or as the twisted creature known as Abeloth. An immortal entity completely mad with power and bent on spreading chaos all across the galaxy. In Legends, this creature was a shapeshifter. More dangerous than Palpatine, more powerful than a fleet of Star Destroyers, more than a match for the entire New Jedi Order. Although she would bring destruction and chaos to the galaxy, ultimately Abeloth was a sad and lonely creature. She was very much still that old servant who was lonely and trying to hold on to life, trying to hold on to that family. She would be driven insane by her emotions and 
would live the rest of her life feeding on the fear and terror of others, only searching for the family that she lost. That family would abandon her after seeing what she had become. And that family is now canon. They went into hiding on the planet of Mortis, which existed in between dimensions. Now, Abeloth has never been canonized, but the presence of her family in the canon makes me assume that she's somewhere out there in the galaxy. In Legends for a time, Abeloth was trapped in the Maw, a cluster of super dense gravitational anomalies in the deep core of the galaxy. It is possible that in this timeline, the Mortis Gods placed her on the path of Peridia at the end of a one-way hyperspace path. Now, I believe this is true because there's another individual who hasn't really gotten a lot of airtime in the last episode who's basically the main star in the show. I'm talking about Ahsoka Tano. You know, the thing is, she should have died a long time ago. But because she was the Padawan of the Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker, when the father invited Anakin to Mortis as a replacement for his role as the Guardian of Balance of the Force, Ahsoka was there as well. She would become a casualty in the struggle between the son and the daughter for dominance. You know, the age-old tale of dark side versus light side. Ahsoka would die and the son would also accidentally kill the daughter while attempting to stab the father with the dagger of Mortis. It was the only weapon capable of killing gods like the Celestials and creatures like Abeloth. But with her last dying breath, the daughter decides to give her powers to Ahsoka Tano at the behest of Anakin. And ever since then, it seems like Ahsoka Tano can't die. When Darth Vader was about to cut her down during the duel on Malachor, Kanan Jarrus, a Force spirit at the time, sent the Lothwol to his former apprentice Ezra Bridger to enter the world between worlds so that he could, at the last minute, reach through a portal and rescue Ahsoka. That's not a coincidence. That's, that's fate kicking you in the ass and speaking through a giant wolf. The entranceway of the world between worlds was located in the Jedi Temple of Lothal, and around that portal was a mural of the Celestials. They clearly are connected to all of this. It's very clear that ever since Ahsoka died and the daughter placed her powers inside of her, this family, the Force itself, has been watching over her. And when Balin's skull struck her down, causing her to fall off a cliff hundreds of feet into the ocean, she was once again taken into the world between worlds, perhaps in her mind, perhaps it was just the vision this time, but what is clear is that she was underwater for hours and somehow did not die. It's almost as if she has some greater purpose, some destiny she has to basically be alive to fulfill. And I really didn't understand what it was until now. You see, when the Mortis God, the father, wanted Anakin to take over, it wasn't just so that he could rein in and control his son and daughter. That was definitely a part of it. But I think the father also was afraid of the return of the mother of Abeloth. He always knew somewhere in the back of his mind, wherever he stored her, that she could one day break out and, and bring terror and horror to the entire galaxy. And so someone needs to be there. Someone needs to be powerful enough to wield the dagger of Mortis and strike her down when that time comes. But the father, the son, they all foresaw that if Anakin returned, to the galaxy. If he turned away from his duty as Keeper of the Balance, he would fall to the dark side and he would eventually die, and he would no longer be able to bring that balance to the galaxy. And so I think the daughter didn't just give her life to Ahsoka out of the kindness of her heart, they also saw Ahsoka as an insurance policy. This is why Ahsoka can't die. This is her destiny, to be the one who can stop Abeloth. Because Anakin failed to do his duty, the duty falls to his Padawan and the Force will keep her alive until she can stop Abeloth. Now in Legends, Abeloth exists in both the physical realm and also in this dimension in between dimensions. And Ahsoka is now pretty familiar with the world between worlds, so she already has a way to connect with Abeloth. It's clear that Ghost Anakin wants her sharp and wants her to be ready to face a challenge of a lifetime. When and where this happens, well, we just don't know yet. But maybe this interaction between Thrawn and these great mothers gives us some insight. Great mothers, I shall once again require the aid of your dark magic. The thread of destiny demands it. This is a crazy theory, I know. There are only a few creatures in the galaxy as powerful as Abeloth. Well, actually, she's probably in a league of her own. I mean, Vitiate was pretty powerful, but Abeloth is Abeloth, man. And Filoni knows the deep lore, and he's the one who made the Celestials, and they always didn't seem to fit into the story somehow. It was always so random. And Ahsoka's role in that storyline was even stranger. 
But I feel like maybe there was a reason for all of this. This wasn't just some metaphor, some big spiritual woo-woo kind of thing. There's a point for Lucas and Filoni to seed this story in the Clone Wars and then continue revisiting the story through Rebels and now finally in the Ahsoka series. I'm not gonna lie, my expectations for this Ahsoka series was average. It's not that I don't like Ahsoka, I like her a lot actually as a character, but yeah, I've just been, maybe I have the fatigue that everyone else has. But now I'm, I'm like really stunned by what's happening. And if this, if this whole theory is, is correct, I'll be shocked because I've always felt like stars in the Disney era is missing this sort of epicness. I mean, they tried it in the sequels, but it didn't really work because they killed the big bad in like the second movie. But here's a chance for Filoni to bring back a classic villain, someone that a lot of fans know and are afraid of. I mean, her teeth gives me nightmares. I think it would be great for there to be this epic struggle, this bigger, larger picture. I think it would make a lot of people care once again. But anyway, it's just the crazy theory. I just am blessed to have this platform and audience to share with. So thank you for watching. And I guess we'll see in a few episodes if this turns out to be true or not.